everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Ecolab's food safety webinar titled, Worried About Fruit Flies, Learn the Risks and Practices for Elimination. Our presenter today is Dr. John Barquet. Dr. Barquet is a senior scientist at Ecolab. He has a PhD in urban entomology and leads Ecolab's pest elimination, product evaluation, and development project specializing in developing effective, integrated pest management programs that deliver high-quality pest protection while limiting environmental impact. He is an expert on a wide range of pest elimination techniques for food and beverage processing, food service, hospitality, and related industries. Please ask any questions throughout using the Q&A feature in WebEx. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Barquet. Thank you, Melissa, and welcome, everyone. Uh, today we will be discussing the topic of fruit flies, and these are also known as small flies. Uh, these are very important pests in the food industry, and as you will learn from this webinar, they do pose a significant risk to food safety. So what we'll cover today is uh, we'll get into a little bit of the biology and behavior of the flies. Uh, we'll talk about what the food safety considerations are of having fruit flies and other small flies within your facility. Uh, what are the conducive conditions? What are, those, what are those situations that actually cause the flies uh, to be in your establishment to begin with? And then, uh, very important, we'll talk about how to prevent uh, small flies from becoming established and then what we can do should there be an infestation. So basically we're dealing with two different species when it comes to flies, and we've got them grouped into large and small flies. Uh, and uh, we're not going to talk about the large species today, but those would be like the house fly on the left there, uh, or the below or the bottle flies. These are considered filth flies. They're typically breeding outdoors, and as the name implies, they are larger than the fruit flies uh, by a significant amount. They're much more mobile. Uh, they are known to be health pests and pests of public health because of where they breed and feed, uh, but they are seasonal, especially in the colder climates. They do prefer temperatures above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, generally, temperatures when we start getting below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, we get significantly reduced fly activities. And the breeding habits, unless something very bad is going on, they're typically just breeding outdoors. Uh, and both large and small flies are capable of carrying pathogens, and it's relatively new information for the small flies, which we'll be focusing on today. So they are generally only about an eighth of an inch in length. Uh, we've got the old typical red-eyed fruit fly that we've known for some time. They've been established for a very long time in food service and food handling facilities, typically pests around the fruits and vegetables, the recycling areas. A relatively new species to the food industry is the larger dark-eyed fruit fly. It's uh, slightly larger than the red-eyed fruit fly. It's much more mobile and much more capable of breeding in more rancid conditions than the red-eyed fruit fly. So this is the one that really we're, we're concerned about today, and it's really only been around for about 15 years or so in the food industry, so it's a relatively new species. They can be a year-round uh, pest, especially in the warmer climates, but like the house fly, uh, temperatures below 60 degrees Fahrenheit will reduce their, their activity. They're capable of breeding indoors. They can come in from the outside, but they are an indoor breeder, which is why we're, we're really focusing on that fly today. So uh, let's talk about vectors. Uh, when we mean vectors, they're capable of spreading uh, foodborne pathogens. And uh, we now don't know that fruit flies, uh, these dark-eyed fruit flies, are capable of carrying and transferring uh, Estrecia coli, uh, Listeria and Salmonella, which are all, uh, all bacteria associated with foodborne illness. So first, over the last decade, the dark-eyed fruit fly has become much more prevalent in food service facilities. This may be due to a variety of factors, including reduced pesticide or an increase in poor uh, sanitation practices. Uh, food safety awareness continues to be an important issue for food service operators and their guests, which, as you are well aware, can can be impacted by pests such as small flies. Also, health department regulations are becoming more and more rigorous and inspections are becoming harder and harder to pass. In addition, our customers, customer or their guests have become increasingly sensitive to small fly activity because it is an indicator of poor sanitation and uh, addition to being a nuisance. 
And finally, information, whether it be a health inspector score or a restaurant review, it is readily available and easy, easier than ever to access, for example, uh, social media. As some, as you, some of you may know, the restaurant review website, Yelp, has started posting health inspection scores directly on their website. Guests no longer have to search government websites for health inspection scores, but rather they can access them directly from Yelp. Uh, so with this increased pressure to keep food safe, to pass health inspections, and to keep guests satisfied, it seems less surprising that small flies are the top pest concern for food service operators. Okay, so let's go, I won't dive too deep into this, but uh, for everybody's uh, information, we'll talk a little bit about their biology and behavior. When we talk about small flies, there are a variety of species that we're dealing with. We're gonna focus uh, on the most important one, the fruit fly on the left, specifically the dark-eyed fruit fly. But we do see other pests such as four flies. These are also called scuttle or drain flies. Uh, more associated with sewer-like conditions. And when we see forward flies in a restaurant, uh, we're pretty worried that we may have a drain line break or a sewer line break, especially if they're coming up through expansion joints. Uh, they're very attracted to lights so we can monitor for these pests. So if there's a forward fly infestation, your pest management provider will need to help determine the source of that. Moth flies are not a big issue, but they do look like tiny little moths. They tend to hang out very close to their breeding source, stagnant water source, sump pumps, uh, mop hand, mops and, and stuff, but they're really not that big of an issue. They tend to stay uh, right near their breeding source. Fungus gnats, not really a health pest of concern, but if you have indoor plantscapes or indoor plants and you overwater them, uh, you could have a problem with fungus, uh, the fungus fly or the fungus gnats, and they're very tiny and, again, tend to stay very close to the plants. So these are four species, but let's focus on the fruit fly uh, for this particular session. And these small flies go through a life cycle called complete metamorphosis. And this consists of an egg, a larva, or a maggot stage, a pupa, which is a dormant stage, and then the adult. And basically, this can take three weeks to go from that egg stage to the adult stage. Adult flies, in the case of the dark-eyed fruit fly, can live for more than four weeks. So they're relatively long-lived. And each female can lay up to 100 eggs per day. So when you think about the math there, they can become a big problem in a very short period of time. Seasonal pressure. Uh, they, can, uh, they can be a year round, especially in warmer climates. And uh, what happens is in the colder climates, <clears throat> especially the floor temperatures are dropping. And that is the area, we always follow the water. So where the water goes with these small flies is where we focus our inspections and look for it. And of course, the water's going downhill and eventually into the drains. And as that floor temperature drops, then the chance for, chances for them breeding really goes down. So in the wintertime, especially in the colder climates, we don't see the, the big problems with small flies that we will see in the summertime. So again, those temperatures above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, very good for breeding. Uh, when it starts to get below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, we do see a reduction in their breeding potential. So, next slide. Uh, we do know that they are mechanical carriers of pathogens, just like the large flies or the filled flies. Uh, they are capable of carrying microorganisms on the exterior of their bodies. That includes the feet as well as the mouth part. Now, unlike the house fly, fruit flies do not have a reflex to taste every surface. So the reason I bring that up is a house fly, when it lands, it automatically tastes the surface as soon as it lands. So it's capable of seasoning every surface it landed on uh, with whatever it was landing on before. So uh, we consider that to be a particularly extra mode when it comes to the house fly. We don't see that with fruit flies, but we, uh, we do know that they do land on surfaces and they do groom themselves regularly. Even though they pick up these pathogens and stuff, they, do, they don't like filth and such on them, so they will be grooming themselves over a period of time. And this allows them to transfer, uh, transfer you know, where they land, feed, and defecate. Uh, so let's go through some of the gory details here. So we'll talk about the fruit fly food safety considerations. So when you have these present in your establishment, somewhere something is fermenting. And uh, indoor breeding sites uh, can be places like trash receptacles, dirty drains, stagnant standing water, stagnant mop heads, places like this. 
and they rest away from these breeding sites. So where they're breeding uh, can be a, a little deceptive because we see them get out into the dining areas and people where your, your, your customers are, uh, are dining and such. So they're not just a nuisance, but we actually know that they can carry pathogens with them. Um, uh, they do need to, uh, like house flies, regurgitate uh, liquid from the stomach to dissolve their food and then they use the sponging mouth parts to, to, to suck up the dissolved food. So that makes this an especially great lunchtime seminar subject, right? Uh, and then, then they leave fecal or vomit spots where they walk or feed. So they have this potential to spread disease. Uh, on the upper right there is a picture of an actual Petri dish where a fruit fly walked across that Petri dish and you can see with every footprint they did drop off some bacteria. So uh, we conducted studies in some Twin City uh, restaurants here, uh, and the restaurant owners allowed us to come in uh, where they had a fruit fly infestation, and we sampled the breeding sites where the fruit flies were breeding, and we could identify those by where the maggots were, where the pupa were, and then we also collected and sampled the fruit flies themselves, brought them back to the laboratory, and worked with our microbiology department to isolate and identify the bacteria. And uh, the short story here is that we found very similar bacteria on the flies as we did their breeding sources. So this should not be surprising. These are waterborne bacteria. Uh, some of them are yeasts and fungi. Uh, but none of them, we didn't find any really that are closely associated with foodborne illness. And that's the good news. Now these would be much more important in a healthcare environment. And hospitals do get small flies. And of course, they'll shut down the surgery unit if they have the one single flying insect within there, and for good reason. Uh, they may be breeding in such areas where they're picking up these types of bacteria, which can be a problem to somebody that is immune compromised. These can get into breathing tubes and uh, can cause infection in healthcare environments. So much more important in a hospital, but it, it shows very clearly that, the, that there's a wide variety of bacteria that the fruit flies are carrying, and it is associated with the places that they breed and they feed. So we also conducted a, a study that has just been published in the Journal of Food Protection, the March issue of 2018. And what we did was a laboratory study, and uh, we, we had fly containment units used for the transfer studies. So these were plexiglass housing units where we released about 20 fruit flies, and in there we had either contaminated or uncontaminated food sources, and then we placed uh, petri dishes sensitive to E. coli, listeria, or salmonella within these containers. And in the control container, we had a sterile food source, so something that was not uh, contaminated. In the other, we did either put listeria, salmonella, or E. coli in the food source. And uh, so multiple Petri dishes, uh, the methods and such are, are microbiology based here. So some of you microbiologists know what we're talking about when we talk about MOX, EMB auger, et cetera. And then uh, after 24 hours, uh, we removed the Petri dish and we got positive transfer for Listeria, Salmonella, and it's a Salmonella St. Paul strain, which we tested, as well as E. coli. So we were able to show this in the lab. We were also able to show this with produce. We had a separate study where we had either contaminated lettuce or donuts. And for those of you that have donut displays, you'll realize fruit flies are really attracted to donuts. I'm not really sure why that is. It might be the yeast. But we used that as a food source and also showed very readily that they were capable of transferring bacteria and cross-contaminating surfaces as well as food uh, through their movement behavior. We also took scanning electron micrographs uh, using our scanning electron microscope at our R&D center. And what you're seeing here are pictures of the tarsus or the foot. So in the upper left, you'll see the tarsal claw. And that is uh, the, the part that's used to grab onto rough surfaces uh, when the fly lands. Then below that, you'll see a, an organism called, the, or an organ rather, called the pulvillus. And that is a sticky organ with tiny little suction cups so that helps them to, to cling on to smooth surfaces. So they're perfectly happy being upside down on the ceiling. We find them to rest mostly above two meters on a wall, so they prefer vertical surfaces. And then what you can see in these various pictures, uh, moving over, you can actually see the soils, the biofilms that they're picking up, as well as the bacteriums themselves. You can see the individual bacteria on the, uh, the ceta, or they're basically the hairs that are on the body of the fly. 
So very capable of moving these around, and this just illustrates you can actually see the bacteria as well as the biofilm. And the reason I talk about biofilm is that's associated with the bacteria where they are breeding. So uh, the biofilm is a slime or it's like a sugar snake for those of you that are familiar with it, and it's a protective coating for the bacteria, but the fruit flies use it uh, for uh, refuge for the larva as well as a food source. So they're very associated with biofilm forming bacteria and we can see that they can pick that up as well. So this really illustrates what they're capable of doing. So I do want to point out that over the years, there have been several Nobel Prizes that have gone to fruit fly research. And uh, what we're hoping for, you know, looking through 1933 all the way up to 2017, which was the last uh, fruit fly paper to come out, we're very optimistic that uh, our paper, which uh, just got published in the Journal of Food Protection, is, is up for the next category of Nobel Prizes. I'm joking, of course. All those other Nobel Prizes had to do with very important genetic studies and things like this. But this is the first paper that basically shows the capability of fruit flies. And a particular species here is the dark-eyed fruit fly, Drosophila repleta. That's different than Drosophila melanogaster, which is the red-eyed fruit fly. But showing that they're capable of moving E. coli, Salmonella, and Listeria from uh, sources, inoculated food sources, uh, produce, and things like that. So uh, anyway, just published, and uh, that is the basis of our research and why we now consider it to be not just a nuisance, but a pest that's important to public health as well. So now let's talk about the conducive conditions. Why are fruit flies there in the, in, to begin with? And um, pictured on the left, when I said that they like to rest on vertical surfaces, this is often what we see. The, uh, the, the picture on the left shows the dark-eyed fruit fly uh, in many numbers sitting up on a dark surface. They do like to rest on darker surfaces. Typically, brown is a, a color that they're attracted to, and generally about two meters up or so off the floor. And they spend most of their time at rest. Their foraging tends to happen in the evening as well as the early morning hours. On the right, we see uh, a slimy material that is the biofilm formed by the bacteria, and then we see the maggots themselves uh, in, that, in that biofilm. So again, they're using that for protection. And this is going to be a place where you have organic matter as well as moisture accumulating, and given a little bit of time, the bacteria can grow, and this becomes very attractive to the fruit flies to breed in. So as an example, this is, uh, this is what we don't want to see in a facility. Uh, basically what we've got is a, a variety of things going on in this photograph. The fruit fly is the true bar fly. They are attracted to the odors of alcohol, of vinegar, and yeast, and all of these are present in a bar area. And in this particular bar, it's, uh, it's really, it really has some structural issues. You can look at where the bar taps are, and if you look down below the, the pans, you can see some uh, corrosion, that green corrosion. There's all sorts of layers and fluids that are seeping in under there, and that will be huge attraction to these uh, fruit flies for breeding. So they're actually breeding between the layers of construction. And this is what uh, we'll talk about getting a pest management provider, but they'll help you identify where these breeding locations are. Some of them won't be very obvious, some of them will. We've also got some broken tile. You can see there's some missing tile, and the grout is also missing. And then moisture and organic matter accumulates here. And if you use floor mats and places like that, the fruit flies, that's a perfect place for them to breed. All sorts of layers in construction material. If you remodel, it's good to remove and replace. Don't build over uh, in terms of layers. Uh, we see that not just in this bar construction, but we see it in walls where marlite is put over marlite uh, rather than redoing the whole wall. You don't want to produce layers of construction because it's not just small flies, it's cockroaches and other pests that can get in between these layers and makes them very difficult to access. So lots of opportunity here for improvement in structure and sanitation, and uh, easier said than done. They can breed in a very small area the size of your thumb. So a lot of attention to detail here. We've got leaking equipment and all sorts of things that are very conducive to these fruit flies. So this is a worst case example, but I needed to show it to you so you get an idea of the things that we look for when looking for small flies. In this example, this is one of the few restaurants I've been in where there's actually filth flies breeding. We actually had blowflies breeding here. It takes about a week or more for a blowfly 
to breed. So what's happened here is this food has been accumulating for a period of time. The blowflies made it in, laid their eggs, and the guys are actually wearing masks because the odor is so horrendous. So this is actually a, a very bad situation. We're not just small flies, but we actually had uh, fill flies breeding in here. Uh, the chefs were basically kicking the food in under the uh, under the food line there, so we uh, had to pull it all out uh, to, to get rid of the, the situation. We can really prevent a lot of pests by keeping it clean and the structure in good condition. This is just another worst case example. Uh, in the upper left there, uh, we see where liners are not being well maintained and you get spillage in these trash cans. This is very conducive to fruit flies. Upper right, you've got ripening bananas, probably making banana bread. Whenever you store your fruits and vegetables, keep them in bins uh, that have a good screen on the top of them. They do need air circulation, of course, but we don't want the fruit flies to have access to them. At this point, those bananas will now be uh, have plenty of fruit fly eggs in them. I hate to say this, but we've all eaten our fair share of fruit fly eggs over our lifetime. But uh, we can prevent that from happening by, by simply storing these correctly. You, you want to ripen the bananas for banana bread, I get it. But uh, typically, it's going to be the, the red-eyed fruit fly that's going to, uh, to ad attack these bananas. And then lower left drains, these are very conducive to the dark-eyed fruit fly, as well as we talked about those forward flies or the scuttle flies, also called drain flies. So we want to keep the drains clean. We'll talk about that. The center bottom photo, that is a sugar snake that has just been flushed out of a drain line. So that is all biofilm from bacteria. And uh, again, I warned you, this is a great lunchtime uh, uh, seminar here. But uh, this is very typical of ice machines, uh, drain lines coming from the bar area. We will see these sugar snakes, and they do need to be removed in order to remove that breeding source of the fruit fly. Uh, they can also cause very horrendous odor problems as well. And then uh, bottom right, uh, mop storage, mop, anything that gets stagnant over time, uh, those are great places for uh, all those small flies to breed in, including the moth fly and the, and the uh, ford fly that we talked about. So keep those in good condition and don't let uh, organic matter and moisture accumulate in any area. Okay, upper left photo, we have uh, some drain lines that are leaking. This is a very common problem. We get the drain lines beer, from beer taps as well as beverage, beverage machines. And what we have there are fungus masses that are actually growing with fly pupa on top of them. I'll be happy to show you a close-up of that in just a second. Uh, in the upper right, we have a, a basically a garbage disposal, and these are prone to leaks, especially around the seams and the gaskets where the fruit flies will be attracted to. They will lay their eggs and uh, will amass uh, in very large numbers from garbage disposals. Bottom left is a holster for a beverage dispense, dispenser, and you can see in the very bottom there, if you look closely, there's actually fruit fly pupa uh, in the bottom of that holster. And then in the bottom right, uh, we've got a beverage tower with leaky, uh, leaky beverage lines, just perfect. We do have the back removed from that, obviously, to show you, uh, but this is another area that we need to pay attention to. I do want to also draw attention to something we don't have pictured, and that's coffee grounds. Uh, if coffee grounds are spilling and accumulating, uh, you know, think about the coffee shops out there, as you're dumping your grounds, Make sure you're cleaning those up and they're not accumulating in corners and places like that because if they get wet, their uh, fruit flies love to breed in spilled, moist coffee grounds. So here's a close-up of that beverage line uh, that we just showed you with the fungus, and those are all fly pupa there uh, where, the, where the flies have laid, laid their eggs and now they've developed into the pupa stage, which the adult will emerge from that pupa in uh, just a couple of days. And then structural issues, uh, leaky machines, of course. We've got the, the moisture accumulating. This is, this is going to be conducive to a variety of pests, not just small flies, rodents, cockroaches, uh, what have you. Uh, again, that tile is breaking down in the upper right under a dish machine. And under those floor mats are areas that are very, very uh, attractive to the flies, and they breed very, very well. Um, try to discourage power washing within your facility. What, what power washers will do will oftentimes blast the soil and debris in and under equipment, making it impossible to clean. They will also corrode the walls over time. Well, shown on the bottom left is drywall, where moisture will get behind the wall, and then you'll have a forward fly problem, and that is a big deal because we have to get behind that wall in order to clean it up. And then just a close-up on the bottom left, bottom right, rather, 
of the floor tile breaking down where you've got the, the grout is missing and you've got water and organic material accumulating and this is another area where the flies will readily breed. Okay, so let's talk about how to prevent and solutions and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll get into uh, taking your questions after that. Okay, so we do recommend cleaning drains on a regular basis. And, um, you know, we recommend weekly if you can, and then uh, you, don't, you don't need to clean all the way down. To, you know, they're not going to be breeding down in the pea trap. The flies are going to be breeding up in the upper surfaces, and there's ridges and uh, ledges and such around the rim that need to be addressed where you have food debris, organic matter accumulating, and use an industrial drain cleaner and a stiff, long-handled brush and pay attention around the rim of the drain. Remove everything. Do this on a weekly basis to break the life cycle of the fly. Don't use bleach. Don't just pour bleach down the drain. That does, is not helpful, and uh, there's safety issues around using bleach. It's not effective just to pour bleach down the drains. I just want to make that absolutely clear. Just use a good cleaning material and uh, remove that soil, and that's going to do a great job. Now, if you suspect a bro broken pipe under the slab, and this is what's going to happen with the, the uh, Ford fly, which is the humpbacked uh, fly version of a small fly, and they are very characteristic movement. Uh, they, they call them scuttle flies for a reason, and they can, they can come out in very large numbers. If there's a broken pipe under the slab, the uh, organic matter will accumulate and the flies will breed under the slab and there's nothing that can be done other than to open the floor, excavate it, clean it, remove that soil, and then fix the pipe. And it goes through so many cycles with the pest management provider telling a restaurant manager or owner that they have to do this uh, before the reality hits that, yeah, there's nothing that can be done chemically. That floor has to be excavated. It is expensive, but it's the only solution in that, in that case. So I just want to bring that up because this, this is not an uncommon problem and uh, it, will, it will breed flies very quickly, and nothing else can be done but to repair that pipe. So inspect and sweep, uh, you know, it's not just the everyday soils that, that, that happen in a, in a restaurant. Food is going to spill. It's just the normal practice. It's those that accumulate and are given time to ferment that are going to be attractive to these flies. So focus on the corners, under equipment. If if a drain cannot be accessed for cleaning, and that happens, right, because it gets under equipment that you have legs from the equipment and stuff restricting access to a drain, and unfortunately that does happen, that drain can be treated by your pest management provider with an appropriate chemistry to prevent the flies from breeding. Uh, we offer that type of service, but um, that has to be a situation where you can't get in and clean it where that happens. So most cases, Cleaning uh, will get rid of the fruit fly problem, but there needs to be a lot of attention to detail. Do not dispose of organic material in the drains. Uh, please put it in the garbage. Uh, now, what your pest management provider will do uh, is they're going to come in and they're going to con conduct an inspection. Make sure you have someone that is licensed, certified, and experienced in servicing restaurants. Restaurants are among the most difficult pest control situations that uh, the pest control industry has to deal with. They're very complex environments. There's a lot of traffic, and there's a lot of conducive conditions that, that happen to pests. And so it's something that they need to really understand uh, how, to, how to manage these facilities, many of which need to be serviced at night because of the hours uh, having to do with the restaurant. So a good, reputable pest management provider that has all the credentials and experience. Fruit flies are among the most difficult pests to eliminate because of all of the things that we've talked about so far. So they need to conduct that inspection, determine what the species is, because that will tell them where the sources are and what need to be done, and then locate those breeding sites, and then they'll give you recommendations for cleaning, uh, any structural repairs that need to be made. And then they can treat adult fly resting areas with certain pesticides. They can do space sprays. These will have to be done when your facility is closed and prepared for service so that they have access to the areas. So keep in mind that uh, it's not an easy pest to eliminate and service cannot be done during the day generally to eliminate these pests, okay? And then they'll discuss preventative measures you and your staff can take uh, to keep these uh, from either becoming established or minimize their presence. Okay, so this is the way we like to see them, all right? Uh, minimize exterior breeding opportunities. 
and we uh, talked about, we talked about, we showed you lots of uh, illustrations here. Close all the garbage receptacles, eliminate standing water, any organic debris, focus on the nooks and the crannies, uh, and then uh, minimize the entry points. So in some parts of the country, these flies can come in from the outside. Hawaii is a good example, Florida, those southern states. Seal all doors, minimize the amount of time doors are left open. If you have drive-through windows, uh, keep those windows uh, shut. They should be on an automatic shut uh, or have air curtains above them and try to uh, keep staff trained that those air curtains need to remain on. There are air curtains that are low noise that can be uh, installed. And uh, another thing to keep in mind is work on your HVAC system. Uh, most restaurants have a negative pressure, so it'll suck in house flies and other flying insects and you can uh, work to get that HVAC adjusted so that you have neutral or positive air pressure at a cost of around uh, a few thousand dollars. And that'll save on your utilities as well as uh, re really reduce the pest entry into your facility. And then inspect incoming goods and reject those that show signs of spoilage. And then like we talked about on the interior, eliminate that standing water, uh, establish those cleaning practices. We wanna get those drains cleaned on a weekly basis if we can. We wanna remove those biofilms and the organic matter. Repair structural deficiencies, keep that floor tile in good repair. Uh, don't create layers of construction. Uh, keep things in, in good condition. And uh, store all those perishables, the fruits and the vegetables, and close plastic tubs with screens, with appropriate screens on them. And then your pest management provider will provide chemical elimination in the, in the event of an infestation to knock down the adult flies, as well as treat uh, breeding areas to keep the, keep the flies from breeding in those locations, okay? So put real quick on, on how to choose the right partner for your pest management provider. Okay, just to review, they should have the proper credentials. They should be licensed and certified within the state. Different states have different, uh, have different requirements, but generally there's a general pest control category that they need to be uh, uh, trained, certified in. Uh, and then you want consistent protocols. These are protocols that eliminate pests that are scientifically based and uh, something where they're gonna be able to come in, use the proper products, make sure they're, they're keeping the uh, SDSs with you as well as the labels should be on site. You're keeping a log book so that the staff can communicate with your pest management provider what they're seeing and where they're seeing it. And then they should be providing relevant inspections on a regular basis, at least a monthly basis uh, for these pests. And then provide you with the proper, proper recommendations. Keep good communication with you, good documentation, and for many pests, uh, we need to take an outside-in approach. That applies to rodents, it applies to flies, uh, because many of them do originate on the outside. So again, the protocol, the science behind it, then you've got the good service person that comes in, and then you will get that elimination that you expect and are required to have. So with that, Melissa, we can turn it over to questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Barquet. Um, so just as a reminder, all of the attendees, please use the Q&A function to start submitting any questions that you have. Um, but looking through the questions that we've already received, uh, the first one is around breeding. And the participant um, is wondering, do fruit flies breed at night or the daytime? Uh, really, it, uh, it, it's all day long. <laughs> uh, typically, as I said, the, the most of the foraging and feeding behavior is going to be the early morning and the evening hours. So this is where they're out looking for their food sources. If they find an adequate food source, the female will lay eggs. And um, so um, uh, they only need to mate once to produce all the eggs in her lifetime. And then about 100 eggs or so per day. So, uh, and then each female, you know, throughout her lifetime, you can lay between 500 and 1,000 eggs. So it's, it's quite prolific. Um, so in a very short period of time, you can have uh, people wonder, well, wow, why do these all these fruit flies come from? This happens in our homes too. You know, we bring a few fruit flies home and suddenly we've got a big problem. So they have a very fast breeding uh, life cycle. So something that we really need to get after early because the, especially if you've got a lot of unsanitary areas, uh, we can see a lot of fruit flies in a short period of time. So, good question. Perfect. And along the lines of the biology of fruit flies, about how long can a fruit fly live? Well, the red-eyed fruit fly, the little one that we've been dealing with forever, that only lives about two weeks. But this newer species uh, surprisingly lives quite a bit longer, 
four weeks, uh, you know, and we've, we've got them in our laboratory, so we've, we've seen them live actually longer than that. So that makes them more troublesome. And another thing to keep, keep in mind is that they do uh, wander far from their breeding location. So, uh, you know, we see them in the dining areas. They're very attracted to that wine and the wine glass and such, so people, you'll see them shooing away uh, flies. And, and it is an indication that something is going on from a sanitation standpoint. So uh, something to pay attention to, and, and yeah, unfortunately, they do, they do live quite a long time, so uh, again, populations can grow very quickly. Perfect. Um, earlier, you spoke a little bit um, about temperature. So we noticed that during the winter months, uh, the fruit flies drastically reduce in numbers or are absent until the spring. Uh, does that mean they are originating from the outside? It can. They can also come in with produce or come in with deliveries. Uh, but yeah, these species uh, can, in the warmer climates especially, be coming in from the outside. For those of you that have gardens and keep compost piles and things like that, you've probably noticed fruit flies uh, either on your fruit itself or in the compost area. So yeah, they can readily breed outdoors. Okay. Um, as we're talking about prevention in fruit flies, one of the questions that came in um, is around, is it better to flush drains with warm, hot, or cold water? Yeah, and again, make sure we get that physical cleaning done under the lips and such, but uh, hot water's fine. Um, if you're using sanitizers, watch out for that because some, some people do, you know, do a sanitizing step. Um, and uh, you, you, the sanitizer itself will help to eliminate the breeding source. Um, we've also found in some cases that it will kill fruit fly eggs. We can't claim that because it is a pesticide, but generally warmer, warmer temperatures are more effective. But think about safety, okay? So when, a, when you've got one of your staff using, make sure it's not scalding hot water uh, for safety reasons. And if you are using sanitizers and such like that, generally eye protection and things, and, and you know, gloves are required uh, to prevent any injury. So whatever you're using, follow the label. Um, uh, really for fruit flies, all you need is a good industrial detergent and cleaning up those sources around the, uh, the tops of the drains. And that's really, that's really gonna solve the problem. And they're not just a drain fly, though. Again, they breed in a lot of different locations, but drains can be a key area. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question has come in around pesticides. The question is, is Delta Dust or Nibor D a good, excuse me, good pesticide for treating drains? Um, now, you need to be uh, licensed and certified to apply a pesticide within a commercial facility, so let's make sure that it's the pest management provider that is doing the pesticide work within your facility. We do not recommend that employees of restaurants apply pesticides with the exception of certain things. Um, it might be an aerosol or something that uh, uh, you can use from time to time, but check your state laws. There are, state, there are about 11 states that do not allow you to apply a pesticide within a commercial facility unless you have a license. Now, in terms of Delta Dust, Delta Dust is a pesticide that is labeled for things like drains and wet areas. Uh, but it needs to be applied when the facility is not in operation and is closed. Same with Nibor D. Nibor D is a salt of boric acid that uh, can be applied in drains and other areas where the small flies are breeding. It is actually labeled for the pest and the sites of application, but again, you need to have the correct credentials and the account must be closed. You cannot be in an operation. And in some cases, depending on where you're applying it, the area may need to be prepared for service to prevent the pesticide from contacting food handling surfaces and all exposed food must be taken out of the area. So again, work with your pest management provider. They should be the ones that are, that are applying these pesticides. Um, another question around the elimination of uh, fruit flies are around natural and green ways. So are there any natural or green ways or products that you can use to control or eliminate fruit flies? Um, in turn, everybody has a different definition of what's natural and green. I mean, arsenic's natural, just so everybody knows. Um, and some of the most toxic compounds on Earth are actually natural. So green is another technology that's used, uh, uh, and it, sometimes we say greenwashing because we're, we're not being green. Um, and we can, we can place these pesticides in a certain category, but the fact of the matter is um, the best green method to go after fruit flies is good cleaning and sanitation. So no pesticide at all, and actually addressing it through all the structural and sanitation things that we talked about. Now that's easier said than done, 
So when an, an establishment happens, there really aren't any really effective, what I would say, green pesticides. A good example might be diatomaceous earth, which is a dust that's made of little diatoms that's mined, and they're, they're actually little glass organisms. And some people consider this to be a green method. It doesn't, it's not effective, okay? Uh, there's not any really good green essential oils. There's a lot of pesticides that are considered green, uh, sometimes 25B exempt pesticides will kill on contact. So these are essential oils that are extracted from plants, such as D-limonene from oranges, and, and then you've got thyme oil and rosemary and things like that. But those will kill on contact, so you might be able to kill the dog fly, but they will not get to the breeding source or a place like that. So again, focus on working with your pest management provider. Keep the place clean and sanitized as best you can. That will really reduce the potential but if they do become established somewhere and you can't access it and it requires a pesticide treatment, your pest management provider will know what to use, what's registered or, in other words, legal in that state. They'll follow the label and it will be used in such a manner that it will not pose a hazard to anyone. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we have been receiving a lot of questions around equipment. Um, one of the questions uh, reads, mechanical devices, bait stations, and fly lights, are acceptable pest control devices. What is an acceptable device that can be used in a food establishment that will not lose points during an audit? Yeah, and that's a big question, great question too. Um, first of all, you need to make sure that um, uh, where, these, where these pieces of equipment are being placed are not going to be either conducive to pest, uh, pest activity or pose some sort of hazard themselves. A good example is a fly light which uses ultraviolet light to attract the light pests. Um, really, you don't want to put that right over a food handling surface because it's going to attract the flies uh, right over that area. So you want to keep that within 10 feet uh, or 10 feet or more of that food handling surface. So again, rely on the expertise of your, your, uh, your pest management provider. Um, and you know, in the, uh, in the United States and, and such like that, we generally have bait stations that are placed on the outside for rodents. Um, baits are, can be used inside, but it's something that's going to be a little bit more hazardous because you've got the rodent possibly moving the bait around inside and such. So this is, this is a lot, this is a, we could have a whole, a whole session on this, but I would rely on the pest management provider and their knowledge because, yeah, uh, equipment can be placed in the wrong area that could be subject to a violation or it's just not effective where they put it. So if, you, if you're putting a fly light such that it, uh, it's uh, placed at the wrong height where, the, where the, flight, the flies aren't going to be attracted to or there's competing light sources or things like that, they may not be as effective. So, um, and then there's pieces of equipment. There's a lot of gimmicks out there and things that aren't effective at all. Uh, and so people can go online and look for different types of solutions. For instance, a, a penny in a plastic bag, uh, a clear plastic bag, does not repel house flies, okay? That's an old wives' tale, if you will. So lots of stuff out there on the Internet that uh, are, are just not effective. Ultrasonic devices are not, not, not effective against pests uh, in terms of uh, the ones that are indoors, and there's a lot of other gimmicks like that that come in. So. Um, again, work with your pest management provider. They'll know the laws, the regulations, and, and what is the effective equipment and where to place it. Great question. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I'm going to look through a couple more questions here. Okay. Does wash and walk help reduce breeding in drains? Um, it will reduce. Wash and walk is a product uh, that uh, is an Ecolab product that helps to reduce the soil on uh, on floors and kitchens, commercial kitchen floors, and it, it has en enzymes in it that, that help to do that, and it also has a, a, a chemistry in it that helps to reduce slips and falls. Uh, and it, its chemistry does happen to reduce the conditions that would be conducive to small flies where, where it drains and places like that. It does not claim, have any claims related to actually killing the flies, so I want to make sure that's absolutely clear. But it can, in some cases, help to reduce the potential of flies, but by itself it's not a solution. Um, when we talk about solutions for these pests, there's really no silver bullet. So you can see that there's many things that need to be done to help combat small flies, which is true for any pest. So it, it, is, uh, it is part of a solution, but really the whole purpose of wash and walk is to keep the floors clean 
and uh, it does a very nice job of that. All right. Um, we have a question around IGR devices. Will those help at all? Yeah, insect, they're insect growth regulators. Um, now, when they talk about a device, they may be talking about a dispenser. Um, that in itself, uh, or you know, a slow release dispenser. There are some of those available on the market. Again, check your state laws because this is an insecticide uh, that would require a commercial applicator's license. But there are insect growth regulators that are labeled to be applied to drains and other areas where the small flies are breeding. And they are at a, uh, one of the effective solutions. So not by itself, but it is an area that can target the breeding sites and it prevents the maggots from developing properly into adults and actually attacks the, the pupil stage as well. So yeah, there are insect growth regulators and by definition those affect the development of the insect in one way or another and keeps them from developing into an adult. So uh, yep, there are some that are effective and they need to be applied properly and again uh, uh, by your pest management provider. Okay. Uh, there's a question around, I've seen strips that I can hang in the bar area to control fruit flies. Do you recommend those? Okay, these strips are probably based on an insecticide called Vapona or Dichlorvos, and uh, there's some out there that are a little misleading uh, uh, in terms of the way they are marketed. They are not allowed to be installed within food handling areas, and that includes anywhere where food is handled, processed, or served. So it can be the bar, and it can include a drain in a bar or anywhere in that bar area you cannot hang these strips. Vapona is a vapor that comes off, it's an organophosphate insecticide. It's very effective, it will work in the areas where the flies are, it kills the adult flies, but uh, it has a four hour exposure time limit for people. So if they're hanging these in an area where people are residing, uh, it can affect the people as well, so we don't want that. So they should only be used in non-food areas, which could be places where food is not handled or processed, so mop closets, uh, places that are uh, not storing food, uh, but they're, they're going to be, maybe maybe it's garbage storage, a garbage storage room that could be hung in there because people aren't going to be there for long periods of time and it's not considered a food area. So the label must be followed, and if you do not follow the label, the label is the law and you could be in violation, and if a health inspector comes in and finds these strips being hung within your facility, it's going to be the person that installed those that's going to be in trouble, and that's generally uh, the restaurant itself. So make sure that the, the laws are being followed, and that means that the labels are being followed on these products. Perfect. So, Dr. Barquet, you've talked a little bit about pesticides. You've talked about the equipment. Um, one of the questions, though, is do fruit flies have any natural enemies that can be used to help control them? Oh, what a great question. And the answer is unfortunately no. <laughs> we don't have any, uh, a good natural enemy example would be like a parasitic wasp. Um, there are parasitic wasps that are available for house flies uh, around farming communities and these parasitic wasps are released on a weekly or biweekly basis. And they're very effective in these farming uh, areas that use them and they attack the pupa of the fly which is actually breeding, well, sorry, within the manure of the livestock that are there but they are very good natural uh, means of going after them. Uh, unfortunately, there are no such uh, solutions right now for small flies, and, and even if we did have them, releasing these little parasitic wasps in a restaurant might not be a good idea. But uh, it's a great question, and uh, we keep looking for things like this. There may be a fungus or a bacteria or a virus that sometime would attack, attack the flies, but so far today we don't have anything, unfortunately. All right, so earlier you spoke about um, a pest control company and coming in and doing their part. The question is, how long should it take for a fruit fly problem to be eradicated if both the establishment and the pest control company are doing their part in this partnership? Yeah, best case scenario, it should be, uh, it should be zapped after the initial service. In other words, you've eliminated all the breeding sources and uh, you know the, the adults have been uh, knocked down. Uh, you may get some emerging flies coming out from pupa that were not affected by the insecticide, and that's generally going to happen within a week. So it might take a couple of services over a week's period of time, uh, but really uh, we've, we've had situations where multiple visits are necessary because of the attention to detail. Somewhere we're missing something. There might be a void that's been missed uh, where that continues to be a source. So it really comes down to the inspection 
and getting all of those breeding sources, which is really the, the tough part about this fly is it breeds in very tight areas and places where we get these fluid leaks and sometimes those are out of sight. So best case scenario, they could be eliminated within a week, uh, but uh, in some cases it can take several weeks to completely eliminate the infestation in, in worst case scenarios. So earlier, I believe you mentioned a little bit about airflow in an establishment, and um, one of the attendees has asked the question of how effective is using continuous airflow, like a small fan directed on the area with high activities as a control measure or to prevent the reproduction? Yeah, air movement uh, does tend to uh, cause flies to sit, to rest. Um, it may deter them from certain areas. But with small flies and large flies, when air is moving, they tend to, to, to more go at rest. Um, there is a fly called the lesser house fly, which occurs in the northwestern United States, which some of you would know what I'm talking about. It's, it's the, the little house fly or the lesser house fly, which tend not to land on anything. And they tend to be in swarms, uh, and they're very, very annoying. Air movement works very good with those. If you can direct the fan in the areas where those, are, those flies are flying, it's great. Um, we do have solutions for donut cases and things like that where we find that uh, negative air pressure, uh, if there's a way to do that to keep the odors from coming out and attracting the fruit flies in the first place is effective. Uh, air doors or air curtains over drive-through uh, drive windows and back doors are effective providing that the air is directed in the right direction and they're left on. Oftentimes employees will turn these off for the noise or for whatever reason, so make sure that they're, they're maintained and they're put in the right uh, place. And again, there are air curtains for drive through windows that can be purchased that produce low noise and are less annoying to the person trying to hear the orders. So um, good practices by the employees, but um, air movement can be effective, but it needs to be, it needs to be put in the right place uh, with the right equipment. All right, so a couple more questions. Um, one of the attendees writes, I was surprised to learn that the fruit flies may be found in coffee grounds. Are there any other not so obvious materials and substances where fruit flies might be found? It needs to be a food-based material. Um, they, uh, uh, you know, it's a good idea to cap your, uh, all of, if you have a bar, to cap the, cap the liquor dispensers and things like that. They will be attracted right into those uh, liquor dispensers and into your liquor itself overnight. So make sure you're capping those every night. Um, but uh, generally, it needs to be a food foodborne material. Um, and coffee grounds were surprising to me too. When we first tried to figure out why are they so bad in these coffee shops that we were going into, we eventually figured out well, actually they've got a I don't know they've got a something about caffeine maybe, <laughs> but uh, the caffeinated fruit flies. But no, they actually uh, the coffee grounds are fermenting, so they're spilled, they're getting wet, and they're not being cleaned up. Uh, but other than that, uh, you know, any storage of your fruits and vegetables, places like that, wherever anything is allowed to ferment, those are the places that they'll be. So, you know, the coffee grounds was really something that was relatively surprising, but once we figured that out, we were able to really fix the problem rather quickly. All right, and one final question. This whole presentation has been really great talking about small flies, um, but you did touch base on the small fly um, research that you did about transferring of pathogens. So one of the questions are, are there documented cases of fruit flies causing foodborne outbreak in restaurants? No, no there haven't. It's very difficult to link foodborne illness to a pest to begin with. Um, and uh, we have not seen it with a fruit fly infestation. Um, but we can, uh, we can trace it to a product, a restaurant food product for which the cause of contamination is unexplained. And so that's, that's happened, and as we've discussed, it's certainly plausible that fruit fly can pick up pathogens and transfer them to food or food handling surfaces, but tracing it back would be difficult. And I do, I'm glad you asked this question because I do want to put it in perspective. Just because a restaurant has fruit flies does not mean they are at risk for a foodborne illness outbreak. I want to make that absolutely clear. All it means is that somewhere there's a sanitation problem and there's potential for their, for their things to go south from there. Um, but uh, those flies, such as house flies, have been directly linked to some foodborne and other hum human illnesses. So in the case of house flies, we've seen it. We've seen it with rodents as well. And then in a couple of situations, we've seen it with birds and, and bird droppings. So it can happen, um, but uh, bottom line is keep the restaurant clean, uh, good condition, structural, and, and we can reduce that potential. 
All right. Well, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Barquet, for all the great information today, again, on small flies, on how we can identify them, what we can do um, to get ahead of it, and the prevention measures, and really what a great pest provider the qualities are of them. So as a reminder to everybody, um, this webinar uh, was being recorded and will be available next week on ecolab.com under our food safety webinar section. Um, some of the materials that we talked about today um, are also available on our flies page on ecolab.com. As a reminder, we do do a number of food safety webinars. The next one is scheduled in August, so watch your inbox for webinar details. Um, if anyone has requested any continuing education requirements, we will get that information out to you um, within the next week or so. And again, we thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to speaking with you all at our next webinar. Have a wonderful afternoon.